Men jag tänker.
703, Susquehanna Township, who just called me. Please stand and play it. Yes, silent. Hold it silent. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Maybe it's single. Like uh, all board members are here except Ali, Madrid, and Rebecca McCollum. Excuse. An executive session talked about student matters, personnel, and real estate. I think what we got here is also a guest presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Guest presentation. No school design. Yes, Adam Burr, uh, but we are associates in Tom Hadry from Bellwood Engineering. Okay, thank you. So uh, Adam Kerr with EI Associates and I have Tom Godfrey um, with Dawood Engineering. Uh, so we wanted to briefly run through the presentation that we ran through a couple weeks ago, um, just to update everyone on uh, the elementary school project and uh, some improvements to the high school as well. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, 1901 Wayne Avenue. We'll run through some plans um, as well as talk about the program and spaces. And then talk a little bit about some rendering options that we've put together from a conceptual standpoint. Um, then we'll touch base on the high school. Uh, we have some conceptual plans to review there as well. And then we'll wrap up uh, talking about, at this point, uh, an opinion of probable costs for those projects, as well as some schedule and milestones. And then I believe we're going to open it up for questions after that. So, so uh, we'll start off with the site. Um, I'll let, I'll let uh, Tom kind of run through and give an overview of the design. Yes, um, the plan as you as you see it there is the same as uh, we had presented a couple weeks ago. Um, if you're familiar with the site, there is I think the address is 1901 Wayne Avenue. Uh, it sits main access was historically off of Stanley Drive, and that was the, the former site of a, of a Harrisburg Middle School. Um, and uh, what you see there is um, essentially a rendering or a concept plan for a school in roughly the same location that the, the previous school had been sitting. Um, it's roughly a 42 acre site, um, maintaining Stanley as the main access as, it, as it's currently shown there from the south and west. Um, it is zone uh, conservation, so there'd be some zoning relief that we'd initially have to deal with with the township. Um, it is uh, set up for the school as a uh, footprint that the DEI has, has laid out. It basically has uh, separate entrances for buses and then for administration and for parents, two separate entrances with a loop around the building. It allows for a secondary entrance there off of Wayne Avenue or emergency entrance if needed. Um, basically provides as well uh, additional parking for uh, two athletic fields, which are shown there in green, two uh, potential synthetic athletic fields and a potential softball field as shown there on the, the western side. The other thing that we incorporated here was uh, at the southwest corner, there's an existing paved area. We're looking to probably expand that to make a, a suitable facility for the existing district vehicles for storage. Um, and then also there's a little bit of extra space there for parking that could serve as one of those athletic fields. Um, we've incorporated various stormwater throughout um, and um, I've also added in, in kind of in the center there the potential for some additional play areas if if that's desired. Um, that's a, a brief overview. The, the, the athletic facilities could also have supporting uh, facilities, um, bleachers, um, press box, 
uh, concessions, that kind of thing as well. And those are kind of uh, conceptualized here as well. So. Uh, so from a building layout standpoint, just to build on the site, you can see, you know, sort of the sort of a somewhat irregular shape. So we've, um, we'll kind of walk through the building plans next, but um, we tried to create enough space for, as, as Tom mentioned, all the athletic fields that sort of wrap around the parking areas, have the space for the parking areas themselves. And then, so the building sort of got a little bit longer in plan. Uh, so this is looking at the uh, first floor plan and the concept there essentially where, as you can see, the, the main entry is on the uh, Southern portion in the middle there. Um, and as Tom mentioned, on the right-hand side or the eastern side, there's uh, the potential for the district administration office entrance as well as athletics entrance on that side of the building. Um, but the plan is a little bit longer of a plan, again, mostly due to the uh, layout of the site. Um, we set this up with a large, what we call the student concourse in the center of the building there. You can sort of see which, which would run east and west through that access to the building. And then we have uh, two educational, sorry, three educational wings for grade four, grade five, and grade six, sort of centered in the uh, uh, the building there, which is flanked by the gym, as well as a potential for an auditorium on the western side there. Uh, so we have some other spaces, some of the special and and uh, uh, music suites, um, uh, art suites, uh, media center, etc. Um, which flank that student concourse. So that's a that's a brief overview of the first floor. And then the second floor is uh, is all educational again with the uh, the wings for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, uh, as we had discussed. Uh, so we do also have some open collaboration areas that are indicated on the plan. Um, those could be potential SGI spaces as well, and be flexible uh, for instruction. So just to walk through uh, the program and the spaces that we've designed. Uh, right now, we are showing 15 graded classrooms for each grade, so fourth, fifth, and sixth grade for a total uh, max capacity of 1,125 students. Uh, we also are showing an additional six uh, support classrooms for each grade, as well as instructional planning centers for each grade, and as we mentioned, some small group instruction spaces. And then we've just included some example images of spaces on the right-hand side from some of our previous projects. Special instruction spaces, uh, we have the music choral suite, uh, the band room, uh, the media center suite, which would also have a computer lab, uh, the art classroom. Uh, we are showing a family and consumers, consumer sciences lab, as well as a maker space in the program currently. And then the core spaces, we are showing a potential here for a gymnasium uh, with up to 2000 uh, seat spectators. Uh, it would have the ability to have obviously full PIAA basketball court as well as full uh, PIAA cross basketball courts with the bleachers retracted and then large enough for four wrestling mats as well. And as mentioned, uh, the plan currently includes a placeholder for an auditorium with seating for up to 1,200 spectators as well as uh, adequate storage area. And then the student dining, uh, we're showing a capacity for up to 300 students at one time. Uh, which would which would allow for a, a maximum of four lunch periods. And then uh, building administration spaces, uh, I won't read all of those, but the, I'll say the typical building admin spaces, obviously with secure entries uh, and so forth, as well as, um, we, as we discussed, the potential for the district administration office to be located at the building. Uh, additional spaces would include the boardroom. And as we discussed, I think there's a potential to share some kind of core spaces between those two spaces as well. And then mechanical and ancillary spaces, the, the kitchen, and the servery, obviously are the restroom spaces and the uh, um, adequate mechanical and electrical spaces. So uh, we put together three options uh, for the exterior. Um, I won't go over them in detail, but um, essentially, this is just the launching off point of uh, um, what we call conceptual design, uh, but to show what a building could look like of this size and magnitude. Um, as we discussed, this first option is, is sort of a sort of a modern feel to it. it. Has some slopes to some of the walls and parapets. Has some modern materials. Obviously, we've tried to incorporate some of the uh, Susquehanna Township School District red um, into the uh, the color of the building as well. Um, again, just giving you a sense of, you know, having some adequate uh, bus and student drop off areas uh, with some uh, canopies that would uh, cover during inclement weather. 
and then just here's some overall views of what that could look like with some of the other entry points um, and looking at the site from a sort of a bird's eye type of view. And we put together uh, two more options. So option B is, is, is a somewhat simplified version of option A, uh, simpler masses, uh, a little bit simpler in the forms, um, you know, but essentially just kind of really kind of allowing materials to be more defining on the elevations uh, versus some of the uh, overhangs and, uh, you know, kind of angled walls and so forth. So probably slightly simpler from a construction standpoint. Um, again, once, you know, incorporating the Susquehanna Township School District right into the uh, design. And again, some overall views of what that could potentially look like with that option. And then the third option was uh, instead of flat or sloped roofs, uh, what, what the potential to have some gable roofs uh, in the design, obviously a little bit more complex in terms of roof lines and so forth, uh, but just gives you a sense of what, you know, uh, pulling in some different roof lines and some metal roofing could do to the exterior. Again, we just want to provide some different options for thought, but really this is the launching point for design. Um, there are many other iterations uh, for the exterior. Well, this is to kind of give you a sense of, of what a building of this magnitude and scale uh, could look like uh, from a design standpoint. So, yes. So on these design variations, is there any, I mean, is there any benefit to, I guess, some of the different, um, like the gabling, is there, a, is there a functional element to that? Like, is it just aesthetic or is there some benefit in terms of like rainwater capture or <clears throat> shelter from the elements and resistance? Like, is it just form or is there some function? You know, I, I'd say there's, there's a little bit of function there. I think one thing we discussed was, you know, the, the metal sloping roofs, um, you know, flat roofs are, serve their purpose. They're probably some of your more economical roofs, but as you know, long-term, if they're not maintained properly, there could be some potential for some repair work down the road. There is a premium cost-wise to go to slope, you know, like a standing seam metal roof. Um, so there is some cost associated with that, but you do get a much longer warranty with the system of that nature. So I, I'd say it's a mix. I mean, my sense is, you know, we might end up with both roof types. You know, we might have some areas where it's, whether it's a gable or some slope with metal, uh, but where we might have some flat roofs area also where we'll need to put probably some mechanical equipment as well. So it's, I don't know if they answered your question, but it's, it's a little bit of both. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I mean, I appreciate the answer with respect to like material, but I guess more yeah. having a more shaded area for these important things, right? Yeah. So having a more shaded area as opposed to having them standing out in the sun sure. versus shelter from the rain. Like, I don't know how you quantify those benefits, but if there's a way to do that, I think that that information is helpful. Okay, as yeah. Well. And those are certain. Those are certainly options that we can continue to look into. To your point of, you know, any outdoor areas that can be undercover potentially. So, and for instance, it's tough to see in this view. And I'll go back up quickly to um, the site plan. Uh, we have in between those academic uh, wings, we were showing the potential for outdoor learning areas. So that could be an area where perhaps some of that's covered with some sort of roofing material to kind of provide some shelter for an outdoor classroom type space. A, B, and C, which one's cost-wise? Give us it. So I'd probably say it this from lowest to highest. Yes. Gut feel is probably B, probably, because it is the simplest forms, and then A, and then yeah, I would say that C is probably, you know, and I don't think we're talking drastic mm -hmm. when you look at this amount of square footage, but there's a little bit more uh, time and intricacy with labor probably for some of the, you know, the roof lines on, on, C, on C. And like I said, things like standing C metal roofs, those are a little bit more expensive than your conventional uh, membrane roof system on a flat roof, so. So um, the high school expansion, um, what we're showing here is the potential for a, a modest five classroom uh, addition to the high school. We, we tried to find a location on the site that was, I would say, the least obtrusive. So, you know, this location here seems to be, um, you, you know, doesn't have any impact on the courts or really any of the field areas. Um, so this is this is the location we thought might be the best up at that upper level of that um, portion of the building. So we're showing, again, five classrooms. Uh, with the potential to have one additional support classroom in that renovated space and then there'll be a connecting corridor 
uh, to that expansion as well. So cost-wise, I, I, I won't recap every line, but the way this is set up is the top portion shows um, the cost for the new building itself. Uh, and then as we move down, say so the building and the site, as we move down, the middle section shows um, uh, the athletic improvements and then the high school expansion is at the bottom and then we can tally everything up. So the way we have this organized is we have line items for the um, separate costs. Um, and then we also have what we call soft costs, which are, you know, um, it's an allowance for items such as permits and fees and construction contingencies and, and design fees and things of that nature. And we're reserving about 22% for soft costs at this point. So as you can see, um, the total, uh, range on everything we've shown is somewhere between 92 and about $110 million. Keep in mind that does not have escalation currently factored into there, which has been a little bit tough to target an exact amount, but we're showing 5% from the time we would start designing to the time we bid it. Now, we, we ran a sort of scenario B, which pulls out two elements from the project, which is um, essentially taking the auditorium out, um, as well as the classroom addition uh, as well. So you can see that that gets us in a range of about 81 to $97 million. Um, now, again, th this includes everything. So, you know, this has all the fields we talked about. It has lighting for the fields. It has a, a small uh, field house. It has, a, you know, the press box, uh, you know, it has all the, I'll say the wants and desires of this project. So it's something that we can certainly fine tune as we move forward in terms of the scope of the project. But right now, that kind of gives you the, the full order of magnitude of what we're looking at. And obviously, as we move forward in design, we'll look for ways to be as cost, you know, um, as cost effective as possible while, you know, uh, make, making sure that we're maintaining the program and, and, and what's best for the students in the district. So. So uh, schedule and milestones. Um, essentially, um, what we would propose is that moving forward from this point, uh, it's about a year and three months that we think it's going to take to get through all of the approvals, all of the design to be ready to go out to bid as early as January of 2026 um, with construction that would start in the spring of 2026. And then we would allow for a good solid year and a half for construction on a building of this size. So this has a potential um, should we move forward um, in the fall here. Uh, to open for the 27 28 school year. And then uh, the high school expansion is, is, is a much smaller project. So that's something that we could uh, certainly have uh, ready before that point. So I think we're, we're showing for the beginning of the 2027 year. Um, so I think with that, we'll open it up for any additional questions. I thought, well, we'll do work with Joe. We'll let the audience, everybody in the audience. When I ask a question, you're asking a question, you're not debating. So if y'all like to ask a question, the audience comment. If you, if you got a comment, you can make a comment too. With the public hand, but I wanted to make sure that the audience get an opportunity to ask. So no particular order. My name is Steve Kreiser. Why are we considering you asking a question that <clears throat> Why are we, yeah, I'm asking questions. Okay. Why are we considering all these athletic field and stuff in this project for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade? I will answer that. I'll try to, but maybe they can. It's not because it's a fourth and sixth grade, it's because of the space that we have and we don't have it at the high school. What business are we in? Are we Education or leasing? I didn't hear you. Are we in the education business? Are we in the marketing business? Both. We, when I say both, I mean that the kids, you're going to, athletics plays a part with the educational part. One more question. Who's sure. going to maintain the administration of all these admin facilities, the marketing, merchandising? Are you asking the, I think, I think you, uh, I just want a question. I can't, you're not, I'm not going to, you're not going to debate and I'm not going to let them debate. So you, you asked. I'm just asking question. who? Okay. Don't have to consider that. Oh, 
deductible. Did we consider who is going to merchandise and market this so we get the dollars back for the money we are investing? So, Mr. No, I'm not sure I understand that question, but I will I, I will speak. I think what he's responding to that we're in marketing in, in addition to education. But I just want to address your first question sure. when you were asking about why the facilities. Currently, Susquehanna Township, as a municipality, have very limited spaces for its residents in terms of uh, recreational spaces. And so a lot of the Is there a survey that says that in writing or sir, 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 yeah. sir, I'm not going to ask you yeah. another question because you're debating. I say I asked that question and you want to answer to your question. But, I, yeah. but will you, I, we can't, we can't, we'll be here all night. The next person, anybody's got a question that I, we can't debate. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's uh, Aaron Kreiser. And my concern is, is that um, we're putting a lot of money into the athletic fields and lighting and press boxes, but yet it seems like a debate for an auditorium. But to me, I think an auditorium <coughs> for the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders would be used quite a bit, like when you have an assembly or when they would have a a uh, chorus concert or band concert, you know, where parents and other people are are coming in. To me, I, I think an auditorium has a high priority and maybe is it an option to downscale the field so there is money for an auditorium? It, yeah, okay. yeah, so I think, um, you know, again, the calls that we reviewed, that captures all of that, right? So I think as we approach going to a time where we go have bid, what we do is we'll have bid alternates that can I, that can identify different line items. We essentially create a base bid, and then we can either deduct things from that base bid or add things to that base bid. So the district would have choices at mm -hmm. midday, which really isn't for another year and three months. You know, so we're not sure our current schedule isn't showing that we would act that the board would actually enact on any bid results until February of 26. So my point is, as we go through design, there are ways that we can look at everything and give options for costs so that the district would have choices to make with available funds versus the scope of the project. So to your point, things like auditorium lights or field house that can be determined at a later date when when that's all looked at together in terms of costs yeah. I, I don't know if that's if that's, that's great. answers yeah. the question if she was on it i saw your name on the uh on the list to well, comments right yeah who's the next person to comment yeah right i also live on schoolhouse lane and i have a question um I suppose at some point, excuse me, this will be an issue when we vote. Does the, the EIT referendum to the, we will be asking voters if they are willing to increase the earned income tax on the ballot in November. And the funding from that increase will support the district in moving forward with this project for the school. My question about the project is, couldn't there be two issues? Couldn't there, there's a school that's needed. Nobody would ever question that. But then, in my mind, the athletic part is like a fringe that maybe isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. And couldn't when when there's a it's up for vote, couldn't that be split that we could vote in favor of either or both? So um, to Mr. Uh, Kerr's um, point earlier, we're not that far down the road. We haven't really decided everything that we're going to do, because once it goes out to bid, the cost is going to determine what we can and cannot do. So what you all are seeing is kind of the Cadillac version of what is possible. But when we really get down to kind of brass taxes, we will be looking to see how we can cut costs. So it may be that some of the fields that you're seeing tonight may not make it into the final iteration, but you're seeing what is proposed right now. Now, to me, the big issue is the school and obviously, Everyone has to say that's okay. 
Yeah. My opinion of the rest is questionable. Thank you. Well, we'll go next. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm actually addressing another item on the Okay, so he's on here to the well, question. No, no, okay. I do have a question. Okay. Um, does the uh, does the school district uh, currently have a project labor agreement in place? Meaning any work that's done on a new building or anything, do you do you make a pledge to use union labor? I know it has to be prevailing wage in any bid, but do you have a project labor agreement? Okay. Okay. Just okay. Okay. And I would so on that note, I would encourage, strongly encourage, if we do move forward with this plan, um, using union labor uh, to do this. Um, you know, I've seen in my experience on the board of commissioners, a lot of times when we use non-union labor, mm -hmm. we have things that we have to come back and correct. We have cost overruns and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we end up in change orders. We end up paying more in the long run than what we would have if we had just used people who know what they're doing in the first place. So you pay a bit of a premium for that, but I think it's worth it. Well I didn't sign up for that because I thought that was part of the public hearing right. minute yeah. section. Yeah. We're sort of, we're sort of mixed them in. If you got a question, you may ask. So my question is the same question that I posed to the board the first week of June when the presentation was made. I asked the board to green, not be guided by the presentation. So my dream is, if Susquehanna Township had a campus called the Susquehanna Township School District Green Campus, what would it look like? Because we're using 42 acres of land that was zoned for conservation. We're taking it out of that for something else. But if we've developed a green campus, what would that look like? Would it? possibly have fields that we planted trees on rather than synthetic fields? Would it have a walking path? Would it be different than what we're looking at here, which I believe blinds our vision to an architect's design of 42 acres rather than a vision of what a green campus might look like? And so I'm asking you, Three months later, maybe you've already visited the land. Maybe you've already thought about a greenhouse. I think that was offered one time. Would it have that? If we envision a green campus, unlike our other campuses, and planted trees, green areas, rather than synthetic fields, the cost of a uh, 300 trees has to be a lot less than 1 million multi-purpose synthetic field. So I'm asking if you would take the time in the next, however long it takes before you envision this plan to think about a vision for our school district that might be a model campus in which we utilize land that was set aside for conservation or something other than land set aside for athletics, because we are often accused of valuing athletics over academics. That's the question. Would you just take the time to envision what Susquehanna Township Green Campus might look like? Thank you. I'm from Thank you. Well, the question is going to be after that. Is there a question for the architect? Well, you got a question for the architect this time? Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that does bring up a good point. As far as your building design, is there any like renewable energy kind of like, could you do solar on any of those groups? Is there any other new innovative technologies to help save energy again? make it more of a, a green building 
I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if that has even been planned yet or how much that would affect the cost, but I think that is a thought-provoking question to say, what can we do to have a more efficient energy type building of more green design? Yeah, so interesting you bring that up at the last board meeting. I think we discussed solar as, as an option that we could look into. Um, whether that's on the roof or, you know, um, so there, that's something that we've discussed for the project. There are also some other options out there for building systems um, where there might actually be some rebates and so forth, like mm -hmm. geothermal, some mm -hmm. other things of that nature, uh, where long term it's going to save the district energy cost savings, um, but also some potential, you know, incentives for the district as well. So I think there are certainly some ways that we can look at uh, more a more sustainable building. Um, we're also looking for the district's long-term costs invested in operating the building for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So you got many of those impact assessments. So to her point and to my point. Yeah. I'm gonna let you ask a question. Well, functional reform, the synthetic fields as opposed to green fields, like do you have environmental impact costs that um, you could provide so that we could see what those number one with the cost savings of like yeah. what the green number looks like, what the green effect looks like over time. I think all of that information would be helpful for us to make the decision and be able to articulate to the public, yeah. you know, what the value, like what I'm hearing over these weeks is like the public wants to know what the value of every single element that we put into this project will be. Yeah. I'm not just talking in terms of dollars, but I'm talking in terms of the value to the generations that are going to be using it, like what's the longevity, what's the half life of the materials, like is this a 50 year school, is this a 100 year school, like all of that helps educate us on like, you know, whether or not to include certain elements. So, so it, it, it's, um, we're actually, we have another project that's out to bid right now where we've done some assessments of looking at long term, not only environmental, but costs associated with natural turf versus synthetic. So it's something that we can definitely provide. And on that particular project, not to get too far down in the weeds, no pun intended, the weeds, no pun intended, but we've also done bid alternates on that project to look at natural turf versus synthetic as well, so that there's options for the district, even at that level of, of detail. So. Is there any What's the cost that you need for did they also incorporate maintenance costs associated to the types of Yeah, correct. That's that's all included in, in those assessments as well as tier one. Uh, any other questions? No, nobody in the public. Okay, board chair, you have any questions, board members? Starting with you, Steve? I don't. Uh, uh, yeah, I would, I would actually, uh, I, I, I like the um, the question about the, the green vision. Um, and it does sound like, I mean, I recognize that we do need the academic, I, mean, like I recognize that we do need the, the fields. And and I would be curious what it would really look like if there was like a, a lead design, if, that, if the environmental was the focus um, to see even just an idea of what that would look like. Um, and um, as, as you were mentioning with the paths and because that's, uh, I can really, I imagine, make a difference, and I guess it would also uh, possibly require fewer parking spaces too. Because I think one of the reasons why we were going with the uh, number of parking spaces was that we needed to be able to uh, accommodate the, the people being able to go to the fields. And I would be curious what that might look like if it was um, more environmentally centered, yeah, or, or lead certified uh, area. It, those are certainly things that we can look at and run some checklists to see what the project could be if it were to get, look at lead certification, whether you went through the certification or not. We sure, should look sure, at it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, the, the certification um, is a relevant kind of thing. Yeah. If, if that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. It's something that we could definitely look at and make some you know, educated decisions on. We think that this principle or that principle would be good one to pull in the design from a green standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right. Well, uh, Um, I just want to make a statement because we're talking about the fields, but they're not understanding that fields are PIAA fields, and the purpose of a PIAA field is to allow not just the school district, but somebody explained to me, I thought we were looking at it as also having games, 
Huntley are brought in to be able to use the fields at the same time generate some income too, at the same time. Am I making the right statement? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I want to say. That's it. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? I just want to think of the, the income that we would, what, what amount of income do we have that will be projected possibly if we were to lease out those fields? Because um, Devin just kind of just trying to figure out the balancing act there to see the, the economics of it. Well, I'll tell you now, most, most places, good example, if you really want to know, you can call Cumberland Valley. They have the state championships there every year, and they don't make any money with renting the fields out. They, uh, the area makes money, and they sell the concession stands, so that type of thing. And I think Mr. Anderson mentioned, and Mr. Johnson mentioned, in fact, about the maintenance of the turf field of grass. Uh, just take a survey for yourself and find out how many high schools in the area has a grass field. So that'll give you a, a, a little bit. Because when you put a grass field down, every game you got to go out and reline, reline. Reline. So it's something that is cost saving. So those are my comments. I have no other comments. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, from the high school. Presentation. Athletics. All right. Hello, everyone. We are seniors from the high school, and we just came to talk to you guys a little bit about the new mascot and logo for Sussman Township Athletics. So you may be wondering, why is this necessary? Throughout our time in the high school, each sport has kind of attempted to create their own logo in absence of a universal logo. And this has kind of created a sense of confusion and disunity among our different sports teams, players, community members, their respective families, and so forth. So we feel a universal logo is integral in unifying our athletic department and its players and those families, like I said, as well as showing a unified front to the teams we play, because obviously it's extremely important that we as an athletics department and frankly, as a school district represent our school, our players, and our mission the best we can to the opponents we play. And having a universal logo can do just that. So our proposal, so alongside keeping the name of the Indians, the proposal is to have our mascot and figurehead be a black bear. And throughout this presentation, you guys will kind of see the reason behind that choice, as well as the history, symbolism, and its significance to not only the state of Pennsylvania, but to Sussman Township as a district. So we, would, so we wanted to begin by highlighting some of the significance that the black bear has in Native American culture, especially those that's around here. Um, it's viewed by many tribes as a spiritual guide being associated with healing and protection as well as like introspection and self um, meditation. The black bear also appears in creation myths that emphasize its teachings and its wisdom that they can provide to um, members of those tribes. And we feel that the black bear can also serve as that to students. And finally, it plays a central role in dances, songs, and prayers that honor the spirit of the bear and ask for its blessings. And the black bear is also a very symbolic animal in Native American tribes. It primarily represents strength, courage, leadership, and wisdom. And it embodies um, resilience, survival, and shows us that it's a very respected figure. And it's also a native species of Pennsylvania. And this in turn symbolizes its deep connection with the Native American tribes who used to inhabit the area. Its habitats and the trees and mountains were used to be viewed as sacred by the Native American tribes. And it shows us that despite everything that's going on in the world around us, we need to keep a strong connection with nature. And since it's a native species to Pennsylvania, it's also a very important, or it was a very important animal in the tribes that used to inhabit this area, including the Susquehannock, Iroquois, and the Lenape or Delaware tribes. And in Native American culture, the spirit of the black bear is known as Mato. And among other things, it represents confidence, agility, quickness, courage, authority, self-healing, 
And these are all things that Susquehanna Township and its students embody, which is what makes Motto a perfect representation of our district and our sports teams. So for our primary logo, we have the district brand colors, which is red, white, and black. We have your board selected name, which is the Indians, and the similar logo of ST. These are recognizable within the community and our schools. What's different, you might ask? The bear claws, which represents what Didi had explained, qualities such as having confidence, strength, courage, and peace. All things that this community wants to represent, and most importantly, leadership. Leadership throughout our school, leadership throughout our sports, and leadership throughout our community. Next, we have our alternate logo. We have our alternate logos. The secondary logo views the upper half of our bear, along with the Hannah Indians, the tri the tertiary logo um, shows a bear's claw with Hannah written on his paw. The Hannah Proud logo shows the district of Hannah, oh, shows the district of Susquehanna being on the map with a star and Hannah written in between. For our word mark, for our word mark logo, we have as seen, here's the Hannah Indians, which you've also seen placed on previous logos, and Hannah, with which you've seen as a bear claw ripping through it. All right, and then this slide shows examples of team apparel that might be created with the unified logo system. And um, all of us are wearing examples of these logos on some apparel. So you can see how it really unifies the designs between teams on the examples on the slide up in the top corner that's baseball even though it is hard to see and then in the middle is football and then finally this is the physical mascot that we're hoping will make an appearance at football games possibly even this season so that is the conclusion of our presentation thank you thank you So Rose, before there are any questions, I just want to acknowledge the students because you all did an amazing job. And I just want to recognize that um, last year, uh, we meet with the student advisory group at the middle school and at the high school. And we just kind of meet with them maybe three or four times a year. We ask them, uh, you know, how, what's going well? What would you like to see improved? And one of the students in the spring asked about whether or not the district was ever going to have a mascot or something that they could kind of unify behind. And um, I'm going to tell myself, I did say that, you know, the adults at this point, we've kind of messed it up a little bit. Um, and so if this is going to happen, we're going to need you all as students to lead the way. So um, they are doing just that. And I want to thank them uh, for doing that. Um, and so good job tonight. Did you, guys ever consider, did you guys ever consider a line? That's what I put. I think in middle school, <laughs> even access holds one of the mascots. I wouldn't do snake anymore. No. For Hannah Prime, I like that. For Hannah yeah. Prime, yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. But I guess there's no sense for that. Please? I see your shirt. I can put the bear on it. I can't snake on the bear. I'm sorry. I just What's my favorite one of? <laughs> You don't look so stupid. Yeah, I don't think I thought he might look cute. Yeah, he's kind of cute. You don't want him to be ferocious? I do. And to be like, you want him to be mean? You do? No. Uh, the bear is all serious. So she wants him to be mean. You said no. No, I don't want him. You have a kid Okay. Just ask me. I like the bear's clothes, period. But I like the bear. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I'm just kind of, um, I'm curious, I, I'm wondering if, uh, um, I'm just trying to think of uh, respect in terms of, I mean, I, and I have to say, I love the, I love the bear, and I, I want to, I had more than happy, more than happy to have a different um, image, and, uh, and actually personally mascot, than, um, than the Indians, um, because I think that it would be, uh, respectful to uh, 
kind of to, to have that shift ultimately. And I'm I'm just wondering whether um, it might be better to shift. Uh, it might be better to have a discussion to talk about uh, a, a possible shift in the mascot to um, to the bears and not have the kind of confusion about having an animal represents the name of uh, Indians. Uh, I, I guess that's that's my only kind of concern with regard to that. I, I don't want to kind of uh, animalize uh, uh, um, the Indians in terms of that. It's, yeah, so that's understandable. We feel due to the guidelines that you guys all have provided, yeah. we feel that the bear correctly demonstrates the characteristics of our district, the characteristics of the bear in the strength that it brought, brought to the Susquehanna Indians. And obviously there are some guidelines provided by you all. So we feel that this was the best representation of the Susquehanna Township Indians and the what we've had for years to come and or what we've had previously, but what we can bring now through the future without using an Indian head or any feathers or anything like that, like you guys have stated in the future. So we feel this is the best representation, but that's a completely understandable point. And if I could also add on to that real quickly, um, yeah. my understanding of it was that um, the last round of discussions that the board had in terms of discussing a name, I remember we had multiple considerations. We voted on that as students and it went to the public. And I believe, I'm pretty sure that the that the board was unable to make a decision on that. So this is kind of a, it's a solution before we can get a more definite solution if there is um, like the political will essentially to, or the desire to move away from the Indian's name. So it just allows us to, um, have a mascot that isn't that doesn't appropriate that other kind of imagery. And I understand like a lot of the confusion with having Susquehanna Township Indians with the bear mascot, but if anything, it's an opportunity to go learn because a, a lot of other schools may be confused, but I'm sure we'd be more than happy to explain to them like this is the history and this is what goes with it. And if anything, it better represents us as a district since we have so many different people like coming together and it's just I don't know. I think it represents us. Really well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, without being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm, I'm so glad I went after the student uh, representative <laughs> of our uh, because he has articulated better than 99% of the adults over the last two year run that I've been on board um, a way to um, maturely approach a topic. Um, that uh, the adults in the room couldn't seem to couldn't seem to address. My question to your group as students, and maybe and and um, to the student population generally, or your sense of the student population generally. I hear you saying within the guidelines that we've set. So, and I don't want to put, I don't I don't want to put words in your mouth, mm -hmm. but. It, it sounds to me like there is some level of resignation over the name not aligning with the imagery. So that's completely understandable. When I sat in the meeting and when we all sat in the meeting, that was something that I was like, hey, that's a little confusing. But as we got to learn uh, the history of the bear and its significance to the Native American tribes, that's something that I kind of came along with. And also, we all serve um, as some sort of leadership position within the school. Dee Dee's class president, I'm class vice president, we have our student council president and vice president. We have a pretty good idea of our student population as a whole. And throughout the time where we've introduced this um, topic to the time that obviously now we're sitting here, we've gotten a feel of our student body by talking about it with them and seeing what's their opinion on it. Because obviously this isn't just a logo for us, it's a logo for everyone at the school, all the coaches, all the family members, anyone who attends any Susquehanna Township event. This is all of our logo. And I think that's the mission of this logo is unifying our teams. And I think that's what it does. Sure. But I guess my question is more about are you splitting the baby with the bathwater? Or is there a is was there a genuine sense that students were comfortable with the name outside of the imagery? Or is this a response to a lack of action 
on the board's part. And this is um, this is your attempt to mitigate what was a failure of the board. Well, I think there certain cards were dealt. We were able to view the guidelines and see what is the best possible way to create a mascot, to create a logo, which we have been missing all three years that we've been in high school and now going into our senior year. So we saw what we were given. We did the best possible thing we were given. And now it's time that we make the best out of it. And I think I know, and I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I'm 100% behind this logo and our name. So, yeah. Very sure answer. Thank you. So if you had no limitations, if those parameters were lifted from you and you were able to select both a name and a mascot, would you still feel that way? Well, if I'm just speaking for myself, I would have kept the name, the logo that I've played with since I was five years old. Um, but I believe that this, I, I fully support it. I, I like it. And also this is something that having a different logo um, compared to the name. That's something that's throughout sports, not only at the high school level, but that's something that we've seen in professional sports too. So it's not an, it's not unorthodox that we're seeing this. But I, like I said, I 100% support this logo. I don't want to speak for anyone else, but that's my opinion. I, I agree with Mason. I think when I was in middle school, this was like just starting to become a discussion and there was a whole bunch of ideas that everyone had. But now that like we have like the idea of the bear, it's definitely something that sets us from all the other schools. No other school has a bear mascot. And I know like the idea of the lion, Peter Cliff is a lion. And I just think, it I think it represents us pretty well, like with all of history and stuff. And it definitely sets us apart. So, yeah, I'm 100% behind it too. What's your name, please? Zelda. Zelda Lee Murray. What's your name? Um, I, I don't necessarily, or I didn't necessarily like the bear at first. I felt as though it was just very, random, but I feel like as I read through the PowerPoint, I understood the 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 past behind it. And I like the um I also like the logos as well. But I also understood the Indians and the Indians um the Indians logo because that's what I grew up with. I grew up with sports, I grew up with coaches, I grew up with academics my whole life. So I really did love the Indians, but I do understand where people are coming from. And there has been a conversation of this for a very long time. So I am glad that we're making change. Okay. Is that it? Oh, I just wanted to say, by keeping the word Indians in it, I think it satisfies um, the people who have graduated with that the alumni. I think you're also pleased the alumni by keeping the word and being fun there also. So I think you guys are taking care of everybody. And I do see an alumni person here, but if you haven't said anything, so if you haven't said anything, <laughs> it's all right. I didn't right. say anything. <laughs> they did a great job. Okay, yeah, that's also a matter. Yeah, because he's, this guy would be saying something out loud, so if he's happy with it, I have to be happy with it also. And I will clear up the one note. The colors are red and white. Thank you. Just remember, You're welcome. we're not red, white, and black. We're not black and red. We're red and red white. And white. <laughs> we can throw black in it because it looks good. Those aren't our colors. Right. And I just like to add one. Accent. <laughs> it's just an accent. It's just an accent. It's good. Okay. Just to have my neighbor. It's amazing. I speak to just about all the kids come by my house, but you never know what they do in school. And and how they represent the district. And Zoe, I just want to say to you, you know, Mr. Rolls, stand up and stop. People and ask questions. You've been honest and upfront. If you're part of this, I know it's for real. Not saying the rest of them, not, but the idea that I, I, I see you, we speak, and uh, I had no idea that you were part of this. So keep the leadership going, okay? Uh, next up is report. So yeah, I, I, a question. Um, I, I just wanted to check in. Um, I, when the Indians were retained as the mascot, there was also a statement about um, a number of things that we would do in terms of additions to the curriculum and a number of things such as connecting with the local uh, local Native American communities and 
one of the things I was just kind of curious about is whether the native local Native American communities were uh, consulted or talked with in re in respect to to this. So Dr. Martin can talk about what we've been doing in terms of all the. Yeah, so I'm, I've been tasked with the list that was that was given that that night. Um, I'm in the process of creating of educational handouts that are going to include some pertinent information not only about the the bear and the significance of Native American culture, but the Susquehanna uh, tribe, um, which is you know, the tribe that inhabited this area. Yes. Um, we've connected with the um, man. I always forget the name. It's in Carlisle. Uh, the War College? No, it's not the War College. It's a Corona school. It's a Corona. It'll pop in my head randomly. But I'm in the process of connecting with local historians um, to be able to get the appropriate information created so we can get it out to the community via a website. Um, we're creating, like I said, handout information. We're, we're going to um, re uh, bring back to life our uh, Native American statue that used to in, be in our lobby of our high school. Mm -hmm. We're going to enshrine that in a case and create a nook in the library that has informational um, things about the Susquehanna tribe um, for our learners. And it'll be, it'll be open for the community as they come in and out of the library as well. But there are several things that we're trying to put in place um, to meet the needs of what those order, what the what was voted upon that, that night or whatever. I'll also add to that some of the information. Um, that we had um, in working with some of the Native American tribes, we learned it was not accurate. And so part of our challenge is finding accurate information to share with the community and not some of the popular folklore that's out there. So that's a part of the, the work that we're doing. Okay. Yeah. So, so I guess I, I would just, in, in terms of maintaining something, in terms of maintaining a uh, name of the uh, and and the logo connecting with the Indians. I I would want to really feel comfortable that this is felt as respectful to the actually to Native American peoples because so often um, uh, other cultures have been deciding what is respectful to Native peoples, and I'd like to really make sure that it's actually and make make sure that it's from the culture from the from the so whoever might be descended from the Susquehannocks or. Or, or, or the, uh, or the, um, uh, there's another uh, Native American center uh, down Lancaster or other. I just want to make sure that there is buy-in that that this is respectful instead of thinking that well, you put all the information there and educational information there, so it is. I want to make sure that it's actually from their mouth. If somebody connected directly to the uh, historical society, mm -hmm. that, how that specializes in uh, tribes in this area, mm -hmm. so we're connected, we're connected with them. Oh, okay. yep. To that point, I would just like to state, like, for clarity, that this particular iteration of the board was not, we have not taken up the cause of, of the name of our, our mascot Indians. And so um, it was not this particular group that settled upon that name. And so the parameters of which it, we were given to work with, those were not set by this group. I just wanted to just thank that. Yeah, to, to Dr. Wilson's point, where she talked about the adults and flubbing this and messing this up. That was not the school. I just want to clarify. Thank you. All right. Uh, reports? Yes, it was a student representative. Um, so it's not my usually scheduled presentation this evening, but I do have a couple announcements from the high school that I would like to share with the board and the community. Um, to begin with, the Roe Kappa Social Studies Honor Society and the officers of the class of 2025, uh, representatives of whom are here in this room, are glad to announce that we are beginning planning and discussions for a civic engagement panel. The discussion will include representatives from multiple levels of government, the media, and voting advocacy groups, and the event will be presented to high school seniors focusing on the importance of voting and participation in the democratic process in a strictly nonpartisan manner. Um, just today, we were we were able to connect with our AP government teacher, um, who has his sophomores will be going into senior advisories and giving them more information in, in the lead up to the panel. So we're really trying to make sure that it includes all of the school and that we can just make sure that the seniors who are old enough to vote are able to have the knowledge and the um, understanding of the meaning of their democratic right there. And in addition, the officers of Key Club in coordination with high school administration are beginning the planning of the Pink Out fundraiser and game for breast cancer. We were recently notified that the Alumni Association was unable to put on this event as they have done in the past. 
but still believing that it is an important cause and one that the school has rallied behind in previous years. We are beginning the process of planning and look forward to continuing this tradition. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. You mentioned voters registration people. Correct. So uh, are you part of, are you in charge of that? What group was in charge of that? Um, myself, Jordan, Dee Dee, and Mason are co are planning the event and we're also going to be co moderating Because I have registration forms if y'all need them. Do you have registration forms? I'll drop them off at the office tomorrow. I'm already registered. It's also online. <laughs> it's all, registration is online. It's well, online. it's online, but, 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 but I'll tell you what happened you get online. <laughs> If your phone can't make that swoop, the sign of signature, I got you. So the easiest thing I do, stand there and watch them fill it out and take it and drop it off. And I know it's in. So sometimes my phone don't work the way it should work. So I will drop some registration forms over at the high school because I, I was there already checking the same thing. So, but I didn't know who was in talk. Mr. President, are you saying that you're having difficulty with the online? Oh, they're very difficult to try to do. No, I'm I'm okay with it, but just the fact that they'll tell you that you have to make your phone do the school and, and sign the signature the long way instead of vertical. Uh, oh, you mean, the, you mean the, the signature, the capture of the electronic signature? Okay. Yeah, so that's the only little drawback on it, but it's good. I mean, I do my mail-in ballot online, so you don't have to do that. So, just yes. to I'll, that point um, real quick, I definitely appreciate you dropping that off, but we're also working with the League of Women Voters of the Pennsylvania Capital Region. Um, so we're in contact with their executive officers, and they will be- done there. I just want to make sure it's all right. I do have a question. Are, does Susquehanna participate in the Governor's Civic Engagement uh, Award they, competition? They did at one time, I think. Mm -hmm. Because I, I see Jordan back there. When you done at the Senate, doing something at the Senate one time by government? So that was for youth and government. That was yeah. all? Youth and government. Youth and government. Mason's that was there too. No, this is something else. Uh, so the, the, the Commonwealth uh, has a competition in, with respect to voter education and civic oh, engagement. Oh, okay. And schools, any school in the, any any high school in the Commonwealth is invited to participate in their levels of for those schools that register um, uh, uh, eligible uh, high school students. So that means you have to be 18, turning 18 uh, okay. before the, before the no, in this case, the November 5th uh, voting deadline. Um, I can't remember what the percentages are, but I believe uh, above a certain percentage, you qualify for a silver award. Above uh, another percentage, you qualify for a gold award. And um, they are essentially certifications, certificates uh, that the uh, the Commonwealth will come out and celebrate your school. So I don't I don't know if we if we do that if we actively engage. That's that's sort of a way to incentivize civic engagement for our government. Obviously, um, you know, it's been effort, it's, it's been talked about in the news about there being a shortage of poll workers. So uh, those Commonwealth citizens that are eligible to, to work in polls certainly reach out to your local county commissions office. Well, quite a few of the kids at the high school do work in polls. They will say we are yeah, closed. Yeah, yeah, they, we got we, we have them there. I see them over there. All righty. Next thing up is uh huh? no no we get rid of we get rid of we have to do it. Superintendent's report. Yes. So I just want to start by again thanking the students. Um, Nick, the civic engagement that they're talking about having uh, the panel for ahead of the election, this is something that the students came up with. And um, I applaud them for doing this. It is nonpartisan. And so it's very important that they know um, about their right as a citizen of our country. So I do want to thank them for bringing that idea to the district. Usually I'm excited about my uh, report. However, this evening, not as excited, but um, it is equally important. We do want to just start by remembering, and I know at the beginning of our meeting, um, we had a moment of silence, um, but I do want to acknowledge the horrific occurrence that happened at the Appalachian High School in Georgia uh, just last week, and just remembering 
those lives uh, that were lost. When I look at these pictures, unfortunately, just uh, I think about our own students and they're here. And um, we're so fortunate here. Um, our, we, we enter, uh, we engage in all of the drills and we have so many partnerships, but you, you, you can't prepare for anything like that. So uh, we do want to send our thoughts and prayers to that school district and that community and those families. Um, also on June the 17th of this school year, Governor Shapiro actually signed into law a mandatory moment of silence for all school districts on September the 11th, which is this week. And so our schools will be participating um, in those moments of silence uh, in remembrance. Uh, the governor feels that it is a wonderful learning opportunity. Um, it's hard to believe that it has been so long ago, over 20 years, in fact, um, that this tragedy happened. I think about our kindergartners and how they probably will have no idea what this is about, our elementary learners. And so uh, but this is something that our schools will be participating in um, as a result of uh, Act 25 of 2024. And Mr. Rowe, that concludes my report. Thank you. Yes. I have a question, Dr. Wells. Where's our junior representative? We, we, are in the, we still have to still select, select that, in, that okay. individual. Yes. Thank you. So we end up interviews with those students that sign up to do the job and then they'll be sworn in. Unless we keep Nick for another year, which I'm happy to do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am out of here. <laughs> All right. Next up is uh, to approve the agenda. So I need a motion to approve the agenda with certain <clears throat> modify. Motion to modify. Can I have a motion to modify the agenda? Uh, motion to modify the agenda. Second. No, 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 no. Motion to. Uh, move. Motion to move. Uh, item 11C and 11D to item 3B and 3C. C and B. B and C. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I do second. Okay, Bill second. Modify the agenda. 11, C and D to 3, D and C. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Now I need a motion to approve the agenda. We also move to approve the agenda as amended. your second. The movement second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 Board members' comments. Comment? Yeah. I would like to thank uh, Chris Franklin and the Handles Foundation for allowing us to come to the yes. second annual Edgemont Day. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Willis and Mr. Anderson for coming in and speak to the public about the new items going on to the election this coming in November. And just thank you for your time and thank you for your participation. Okay. You're with us all day. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, just would like to note that on September 15th, we begin the month of Latino Hispanic Heritage Month. Observation is from September 15th through October. I think we already went over a hand of the public. Did we call no, everybody? No, there, there, no, there, there, no, there, there was somebody else? Yes. Yeah. Now it's time to come up a hand of the public. Who's that people? They did. They did. That's what, remember when I asked them? She, they, they yeah. have other comments, but that was something separate. Right. Okay. Okay. okay, we'll see. Yeah. Did, you, did I ask y'all, did y'all, do you have something else to say? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we did over there. Okay. Just here. Did you, were you, Mr. Fleming, were you in there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He's on yes, it. Yes, and I, I have another agenda item I'd like to oh, speak okay. to. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I've met most of you, all of you at this point now, but I'm Lori Scheibel, um, the executive director of Hannah's Pantry tonight. I wear many hats, but that's who I'm speaking to as tonight. I'm not a parent, not a part of you know the district uh, employee, but um, I just wanted to take a minute to um, invite everyone here, everyone in the community, um, to Hannah's Pantry's fifth anniversary celebration. It will be celebrated on um, September 26th, which is a Thursday night. Um, we have tickets on sale on our website, little QR code I'll put over here. Um, we uh, will not be taking tickets at the door, which is why I'm here um, to let everybody know that we need to uh, have them done ahead of time because Capital Blue Cross is actually our host. So we'll be hosting this over at their new headquarters. It's a brand new room that hasn't been um, hosted by anyone yet. We're the first community um, organization to have an event there. So we're really excited. Um, we're going to have some great food. Um, our, they are our presenting sponsor, obviously, but uh, La Mountain Laurel Catering is actually going to be donating some wonderful food. Um, we're going to have some great raffles and um, some other fun. And we're going to be honoring the diversity of our community and the diversity of Hannah's Pantry through food and some other things. Um, so we invite you all to come um, and just support our community. Um, it's really hard to believe that we started this organization uh, in 2018. Dr. Willis, we talked about this last week, um, but just real quick numbers, we served 40 families um, in September of 2019. Um, in August of 2024, we served 701 families. So the immense growth um, will sort of be celebrated through video and stories at our anniversary event as well. Um, and, and while I have your attention, I just wanted to note that the pantry um, very happily uh, worked with the Hand Foundation, actually, um, and was able to provide uh, breakfast for um, every single uh, student during summer school. They had the option every day of summer school. We made sure we had food there. And it wasn't just a granola bar. We actually had food. Right, Mrs. Martin? We had, we had a great uh, we had a great turnout for those folks, um, and Mr. Rawls was um, the proud griller of a lot of the food that the pantry provided for the back to school bash. So we provided a significant amount of food, um, and you did a great job grilling up those chicken hot dogs, Mr. Rawls. <laughs> So um, I also have forms. We still have some ad opportunities, some sponsorship opportunities um, and things like that. Um, and if you can't make it and you wanna make a donation, obviously we will always be happy to take that. Um, we can take cash check and we have on our website at hannahspantry.org as well. So that's it. Thank you all for the time and uh, all of you that volunteer, we love that and we'd love to have more. So yeah, say it again, yes. they're $50. It's $50, but lots of great raffles and stuff to follow. So for the, um, the uh, Thursday night, Thursday night from six to nine. Yeah. The 26th. So I'm going to leave this over here. Oh, and we have to pay, we have to get the tickets. One. We have to, you have to pay ahead of time. So I'll, I'll, we'll take tickets up till Thursday, but because of the security over at Capitol Blue, we actually have to give them a list of um, attendees before the event. So, um, is it, is it, in, is it, it's in their existing building. Yes, the existing building. It's a portion of it. It's a wonderful room of technology. So I highly encourage you if you're looking at new things for um, the new building over there, check it out because it's um, very impressive. <laughs> so, and I hope to see you there. Thank you all. Just go with myself. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. You want to? Come on, Mr. Okay. I'll do it now. All right. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. I don't have time to live it on. But I'm, I'm going to stay to hear uh, what what is said about this particular item. But um, thank you all. Uh, it's great to see everybody again. It's, it's been a while. Um, but I wanted to address something that you have on your agenda, um, item 9A, um, the National Association of School Nurses Type 1 Diabetes Pilot Program. So uh, unsurprisingly, for those of you who know me, um, uh, I, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, engaging in this. Um, we've had a lot of interaction and um, the, the school nurse, Jennifer Halfond, is Susquehanna alum and um, you know we we've 
remain in constant contact with her and the individual school nurses at um, at the school in which my our daughter attends, um, which had been Sarah Lindemuth Holtzman, and now she's a seventh grader at the uh, Susquehanna Township Middle School. Our daughter four years ago was diagnosed with type one diabetes on June 11th, 2020. Um, she has lived with that and um, coped with that for for more than four years now. She just had her 12th birthday on uh, on Sunday. So happy 12th birthday, Emily. Um, and it's. While it's difficult, it's not impossible. It requires daily maintenance. She is insulin dependent, so she needs insulin every single day in order to keep her blood glucose at a level that is life sustaining. Um, if she does not have access to insulin, her blood glucose could spike uh, and she risks uh, death due to something called diabetic ketoacidosis. And uh, that is the case for every type one diabetic. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for engaging in this pilot program. I know she's not the only one in this district. Um, and I will share something that was shared with us when she was initially diagnosed. We took her to the emergency room at uh, Penn State Hershey Medical Center. And um, the next day she was held overnight for observation and her blood glucose stabilized. The next day we had to go to another one of their buildings for uh, diabetes education. Basically, we had to learn how to take her home and manage her insulin intake and how to do the calculations and uh, do everything that was required to care for her on a daily basis and care for her with this new condition and this new reality. And um, the endocrinology staff over there is amazing. They are world class. And uh, they told us that um, they asked us what school district she was in. And we said Susquehanna Township and she said, OK, you guys won't have a problem. And that made me feel really, really good because and, and we also had an advantage. It was the pandemic. So we actually had her not only was she diagnosed in the summer, but. You remember that environment we chose to do that was her third grade year. We chose to do all remote access for her. So we she was at home with us. So we had a lot of opportunity to learn um, and, and manage her condition. So, um, you know, on behalf of, of other parents of, of type ones, I just want to say thank you. And I just want to mention one other thing that, that I am hopeful um, you all will also experience. I currently have a bill uh, in the General Assembly. I'm the prime sponsor of House Bill 2185, um, which would um, have uh, mandate that that school nurses or school personnel uh, send information out to parents and guardians about the warning signs of type one diabetes. Too many kids still die from it because their parents don't know or their guardians don't know what is happening. And we were in that same situation. Our daughter lost a bunch of weight. She was, you know, eating voraciously, drinking voraciously. We had no idea what was happening. And it turns out she was suffering from type one probably for months before it was finally detected. Um, and again, the risk of that is this this condition going undetected for a number of months. And then, you know, next thing you know, a child is dead unnecessarily from diabetic ketoacidosis or either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, a blood glucose that is too high or too low. And so uh, it is it is entirely preventable. It is treatable. It is manageable. We deal with it every single day. Um, and so I am hopeful that uh, my bill passed the House uh, with overwhelming bipartisan support. I'm hoping it will be taken up in the Senate this fall uh, before the end of the legislative session. So uh, that is my hope. But I do want to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of all parents. Uh, and I look forward to hearing more about the pilot program. So I'm going to stick around for the rest of the uh, rest of the meeting, but thank you so much for engaging in this and being on the vanguard of a, a really big issue for, for a lot of parents and a lot of kids in the district. Thank you. A three B and C. Okay. 
Okay. That's number 11. We move there. 11 C and D. Move to 3 A and C. Thank you. 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 Yeah, that's good. No, I was asking about their um that's what we get ready to do that. Okay. That's what I was asking someone to make that motion to approve the tax logo, the logo can approve the bear. Johnson Edmonton. DNC. Mr. Johnson. Johnson moves. We're gonna get a second. And move in second. Uh Lamel. 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 Any discussion? Uh, I just I I just want to commend the student committee again. I think you guys did a remarkable job of threading the needle. Um and regardless of what I think, regardless of what alumni think, I think like this does marry um very dis disparate interests um, into something that I that I hope will be um, will will do justice and do honor to the legacy of the people that we're trying to um, that we are trying to um, amplify um, and uh, you know we'll. We'll, we'll see what happens, but I, I I wholeheartedly support it. I love the logo. I, it's clear that you put a lot of time into it. Um, I think it's uh, it's a it's a great it's 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 smartly designed, and I hope that it does have the effect that you um, have stated, which is sort of unifying the students behind a uniform identity and brand. I hope that the alumni and the townspeople appreciate the level of effort, thought, and compassion that you put into this. Anybody else? Also, uh, yeah, I also wanted to say thank you very much for all the effort and that you put into this. I know that it's been, a, I imagine, it's been challenging to try to uh, put all of this together. And, um, I really respect and honor everything that you've done. Uh, um, on my end of things, I'm all in, all in favor of the, the, the bear imagery, and, um, and I think that uh, the question of the Indian is something for us as a board to, to discuss um, more completely after this. We'll do a roll call. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Order on B and C to prove the uh, logo and image of the beer and the hand. Okay. Yes, yes, no, I, I understood. I just okay. think that's yeah. all. Thank you. Do you want me to read the yeah, roll call? Oh, you, oh, you can read it too if you want to. Be. So 3B is to approve the attached logo for all official purposes, except athletics, to replace the previously board approved logo. And then 3C will be to approve the use of the bear imagery for athletics. We're voting on both of these together. Mr. Thomas? Uh, yes. Ms. Hatcher? Yes. Ms. Lamell? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. yes. Mr. Steve Johnson? Yes. Bonnie Johnson? Yes. Mr. Rawls? Yes. 7 0. 2 F. Yes, Scott. Great job. Somebody's going to be a lawyer. Out there. <laughs> If you have homework at this time, you're welcome to. Yeah. Oh, all right, good. all right. Thanks. And y'all can bear with us. I saw y'all smile. That is a problem. <laughs> <laughs>
You said approximately five minutes is up the field. For five minutes, all right. <laughs> no, it says ten. No, uh, I'll shoot for five. All right, so I'm here to present um, data from our past uh, summer school sessions for all four of our buildings. Um, so I'll start here with the high school. It's a little bit more intricate than everyone else. Um, basically, all of our learners at the high school level uh, engage in summer school through our uh, Kaola online platform. Um, it's for two, two reasons. We have acceleration and we also have credit recovery. So acceleration learners are were given opportunity to do just that, move through some selected courses um, towards graduation requirements and the recovery for learners to recuperate credits that they might not have received during the normal school year. All right, so we have a lot of data here. Um, I'll try to give you the gist of it. This is just an enrollment by credit type. So you can just see how many learners um, engaged in what type of credit. So we have about um, a quarter of our learners health and PE, another quarter in math. Um, we had about 20% in science. Uh, making up the majority um, of that chart there. All right, so um, let's continue with the data. We have on the left side here, we have the completion of all the enrollments, and then we have completion of all credits on the right. So basically 96% of our learners, whether they were in credit recovery or acceleration, uh, were successful in the courses that they took during the summer session. Um, and it, it broke it down by students here. We had about uh, 262, I feel like, in credit recovery and about 112 in acceleration enrollments. And the percentages of their success, um, we just split it there. So you can see 96% of credit recovery learners uh, were successful and can and obtain those credits. And about 107 of our 95% uh, of our learners were um, completed their ex accelerated course that they took through Kaola. All right, the middle school is a little different there. Um, their summer school was hosted uh, in person, um, so they were afforded additional in-person instruction from 8 to 1130. Um, they were identified by uh, looking at their learning outcomes um, within our um, learning platform and uh, the number of courses that they needed to complete to move across their, their progressions that they were on. So about um, 147 students were recommended to attend. We have the grade breakdown there for you to see. Majority uh, seventh grade, but pretty even split there. A lot of 147, 58 total student, students took advantage of an opportunity, uh, which is kind of typical amongst our K to eight. So uh, 96 uh, additional learning outcomes were completed amongst the 58 attendees. Um, middle school did a good job of breaking down those instructional hours, over so 4,060 additional hours of instruction. We tally up all those learners. 100% um, of the attendees met their goal to complete their missing learning outcomes and be on pace of study for this upcoming school year. All right, so Thomas Holtzman, um, they invited 268 three to five learners. This was identified through their MTSS process. Um, 71 learners signed up to attend, a 50, 55 attended more than one day. Um, it, it'll be some interesting data to, cause I, I know this will be a question for you all at the end, so I'll try to answer it right when we get to the next school. So we have uh, 48 out of 55 attended more than 50% of the time, 40 out of 55 attended more than 75% of the time. 84% well, uh, 84, 84 of all students who were attended were introduced or working at the same group. So when I say groups, it's kind of what I'm talking about at the middle school level. Every learner was in a target group. They started at that group and they worked through that continuum throughout the course of their summer school um, stay. So it, we, it's just two subjects, ELA and math. All right, so Sarah Lindemuth, um, we Sarah Lindemuth opened up summer school to all learners and 139 students signed up to attend. So I, I, I threw that out there to say Thomas Holtzman invited a select few, 268, and they got 58 learners to attend. Sarah Lindemuth opened it up to the whole school and 139 signed up but did not attend. So we'll go to the next slide. Both Holtzman and Sarah, Sarah Linda Moose Day was designed the same. You got breakfast, you got literacy block, math block, and we threw a specials in there. PBIS incentives and lunch. 
So out of that, 95 uh, learners attended for Sarah Lindemo. So you can see not too much difference in the, the inviting the whole school or, or inviting that targeted list. So that's why I, I figured somebody might ask that at the end. But, so we tried it both ways. You still get kind of get the same, the same uh, crop of kids. So the data, 75% uh, 70 of students who attended summer school increased at least one area of, uh, on their Acadians reading score. And that's in the LA. And in math, 97% of students uh, were introduced or moved to the next math group that they were working on. So um, and those who did attend, data did suggest that summer school had an impact on their learning progressions. So, so for the lower grades, it wasn't um, the purpose of the summer school program wasn't for uh, attention. It was acceleration in, in all of those cases. So. That's a two part answer. We don't typically typically try to accelerate, like we're not about to look into like promote your gain credits to like move to the next school, but we're also not having you come to summer school because we're looking to retain you either. So it's just at the K to five level, it's just an opportunity to extend your learning through the summer to just prevent that summer learning loss. If that makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, but the obvious benefit that those kids are prepared. Absolutely. So at, at the, at, K to two level because we open up to all learners. So typically, if you had a learner that was already accelerating, they could have attended summer school, been working on their outcome. And so, if I was a first grade learner and I was given material of where I where I was at, I probably could be maybe moving on to the second grade. Typically for the summer, right? Mm -hmm. It worked. It worked both ways. Yep. Is the free to all students or is it free? Free. Hearing the invitation, so is anybody required to go to summer school order or is it like oh, you see, you see, so at the high school level, you know, if I'm a if I'm a senior and, and you know, and I've held a couple courses and I needed those courses to graduate, uh, you know, you're gonna see that they, they probably it was required for them to, you know, to be able to get that get that diploma or whatever. But at the K to eight level, we we don't necessarily require anybody to attend summer school. Yeah. That yeah, so I tell you what, I tell you what a lot of learners took advantage of at the high school level was that acceleration portion. Because uh, you could take a Kaola a PE or health credit in the summertime and kind of get that, that credit out of the way. So we did see an uptick in that um, over this past summer. Yep. What percentage, like, was the entire curriculum open uh, during the summer school, or did you have a select? number of like what was the what were their choices well when you go can you go back to the high school slide at the k to five level we're talking ela and math right but they did have um the specials included the science some stem like we included some of those things but at the, at the secondary level um you've seen them working across progressions that work across uh curricular right but, but at the high school i mean when you have those when you have those kaola courses it's pretty open to whatever you need Not just reopening health PE so that you can get it out of the way. If you want to take uh, European history or American history, Kaola has a spread of courses that you may select to take across the summertime. And if and uh, and that's for acceleration. And then for those courses that you take during the school year that you may or may not achieve those credits, you can select from that as well. Yep. So you look at art and humanities. That could, that's probably three or four different type of courses, to be honest with you. Like a lot of things go underneath that umbrella. Yeah. What? For the younger learners, that'd be the summer programming. Mm -hmm. Are you tracking them through the end of the year to see if they're making an advantage? Yeah, so what we typically do is we look at our summer learners when they enter and, and try to look at what their data was before they exited our, our school district the previous year before and to see like what that we always try to track that summer loss um coming in so yeah we do try to keep an eye on the learners that attended summer school and what the impact was entering into the next school year all it says they started school year. every level was assessed yep every summer just so that we know where to start they would already say what the summer school or not what about at the end like mm -hmm. around the year okay and even at the end of the summer school do we ever survey the parents um, with respect to attendance um, as to like reasons for 
setting and reasons for? Yeah, so I have, I, I'm going to speak for myself. So like in the past, I've sent out, at, when, I, when I was a golden principal, I sent out a survey to try to figure that out because that that's kind of where we got to at the K-2 to building, just inviting in everybody. Because um, we were seeing that the numbers, well, I wanted to see what, what the numbers shoot up or, you know, but we look at um, at that K to two level. I'll probably say typically the K to five level. It's half day, so it kind of puts parents in a tricky situation to get that that daycare. Even though we provide transportation and things of that nature, but in the summertime, coordinated with work schedules. Uh, what do I do with my child after eleven thirty or twelve o'clock when they get home? Is this easier for them to maybe say they just want to be here like all day, you know, than, than making that transition or whatever? So I, I think I think for the K to five level, that's probably the biggest caveat to um having there or not and then we we've discussed having full day um summer and then you start talking about staffing it um that's not very favorable to the teachers kind of yeah they kind yeah they kind of like having the uh the schedule like it is because uh, it was one year where we couldn't really staff it appropriately and a lot of learners suffered we had a, we actually had a waiting list that year um because we just couldn't get the staff to staff it source and I know that's tricky with summer camps because a lot of them are happening too, but like that, you know, for AM, PM. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, yeah, so what we did, what we had this year is we actually had Parks and Rec uh, ran their summer program and they always do, they run it in our building. So we always um, communicate that to families that, but then they have a limited amount of learners that they could take. So, but we, when we have the conversation with parents about summer school and they pose that as a potential reason, why or why not, we always say that we can connect you to Parks and Rec to extend that day. Um, so it leads into, you know, when you get off work uh, to be able to come get your learner. Yep. So that's one of our partners. And, they, and typically a lot of the, we provide the transportation. So if a kid goes to like, I don't know, like tiny learners or something like we, we can still get you there, too. So we try to like explain that portion as well. But then sometimes parents say they end up paying a rate that is still the same. So if they want to pay that whole day rate, then, it, you know, it, it, it's a little funny there. That is a topic that maybe we could bring up to some of our P3 partners to, uh, to see what that looks like for them in the summertime. But, you know, business is business as well, too. So the opportunity for high school students to spread it or maybe the afternoon shift of summer academy? Perhaps. Some of our high school students actually work for Parks and Rec. So. Yeah, typically that is staffed by a few of our yeah. high school kids. Yeah. I, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, yeah. Thoughts to like try and I don't think that we've it. actually engaged in conversation to extend that out and maybe make that more a thing. But uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, right, right, right. Questions about y'all are asking about. Well, you know, gee, you was at the end there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told them you, you five minutes and put the pedal to the metal. I don't think they have any other questions. If they do, I'd like to know what they are. They ask, go ahead on. Everybody ask. More questions? I think it's something I'll ask you right here. That's fine. <laughs> I'll be there. Okay, thank you. All right. How long was that? I'm a I'll go ahead and get started then with my uh, eight minutes. Um, so I'll be providing the board with an overview of our 25-26 fiscal year. Good, Ms. Ross. Not in here. Get your water. <laughs> okay. 
I said, well, I'll be providing you with a brief overview oh, sure. of the of the five six fiscal year budget development timeline. Okay. So as always, uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to send them my way. So I'll start by sharing that um, there are essentially two different budget development timelines that that really run parallel with one another as we look at um, developing the budget every year. So the first is what I've always referred to as an internal budget development timeline. It's the timeline that we essentially share with our administrative team members, again, providing them with the appropriate instructional materials, again, explaining to them how to assemble their budgets. But this evening, we will focus on the public budget development timeline, which is a timeline that really is developed to um, comply with Act 1, as well as Pennsylvania Public School Code. Now, with that being said, it's so early in the process that the Commonwealth has not yet issued their Act 1 timeline. In addition to that, they have not issued the Act 1 index for the 5-6 fiscal year. But we have enough experience with this to put together uh, a budget development timeline that will be pretty responsive to what the Commonwealth is going to issue. So the board basically has two pathways available to it each year uh, to move through the budget development process. There are two options. One is referred to as option one, the other is option two. With option one, the board is essentially saying that regardless of what it, it what regardless of what it encounters through the budget development process, it's basically going to be able to operate at the Act One index or below, right? So for the last year, the Act One adjusted index was 6.4%. Again, we don't know what it is yet for 5.6, but as soon as we have that number, I will certainly share it with the board. So the other option is a four-step process, and that is the option that applies in those instances where the board is seeking to raise taxes above the adjusted Act One index. So two pathways, two avenues to get the budget developed. All right, so with respect to option one, again, I mentioned that it is a two, commonly referred to as a two-step process. When I say two-step process, there are two official actions that the board must take throughout this process. One is in May, so in this year would be May of 2025. The board would be charged with adopting a proposed final general fund budget. And then in June, the board will be charged with adopting a final general fund budget. Now, two other very critical pieces associated with this option are by January, and last year it was by January 5th. Again, we don't know what date it will be this year. But early by early January, the board has to opt out. That is essentially certifying that it's not going to raise taxes above the index, again, regardless of what it encounters throughout the budget development process. Then within five days subsequent to that action, we must file uh, the opt-out resolution with the Pennsylvania Department of Ed. All right, now with option two, this is the four-step process. And when I say four-step, all I'm really talking about here is the board has to take four official actions through this process. One is in December of 2024, the board would adopt a proposed preliminary general fund budget in January 25, a preliminary general fund budget and then in May of 2025, the board would adopt a proposed final general fund budget. And then in June of 2025, the final budget. So again, that's the four-step process. Much more labor intensive, obviously. There's some other um, requirements that apply. There are various forms and public postings and advertisements that have to take place. I'll start with sharing that from a public inspection perspective, both the proposed preliminary as well as the proposed final budget has to be placed in here for 20 days for public inspection. Um, it's also required that that budget be presented on form PDD, PDE 2028. It's a state issued uh, budgetary form. And again, the development process. The other thing that has to occur is 10 days prior to adopting either the preliminary or final budget, the board is charged with notifying the public that that forthcoming adoption is going to be taking place. We uh, make that notification through our local newspaper. And then last but not least, I've already made reference to this. We have to use the PDE 2028 form uh, when completing the budget. So as we're moving through the budget process, as you guys are aware, we do lots of presentations on PowerPoints, but again, there's an official form that we have to uh, 
submit and file with PDE as we move throughout the process. So if in fact the board is looking to uh, or seeking to raise taxes above that index, there are a number of other pertinent actions that have to take place. Number one, the board has to ensure that we post and publish a notice of intent, uh, basically letting the Commonwealth know that we're going to be applying for the Act 1 referendum exceptions. That information also has to be posted on our district website. Uh, the next step in the process would be that uh, there's a deadline, obviously, to submit that information to the Pennsylvania Department of Ed. And then last but not least here, uh, there is an opportunity to take a question to our voters uh, to raise taxes above the index. And you can see what that looks like there. All right, so the Act 1 process is really about transparency and accountability, right? At this point, uh, as we consider the budget development process, uh, the recommendation would be to move to the two-step as opposed to the four-step process. And so this starts with a very brief conversation as we're having this evening regarding the budget development timeline. In October, we'll talk a little bit about the local, the state, and revenue composition. In December, we'll take a look at both sides of the equation. So we'll talk revenues, we'll talk expenditures, we'll talk about how we anticipate the future funding to impact the school district fund balance. And then, as I said earlier, in May, the board will be charged with adopting the proposed final budget. And then in June, the board will follow up with the final adoption um, of the budget. Um, there are also four other opportunities for us to talk with the board each year about the budget development. <laughs> uh, those opportunities occur through our finance committee meetings, and you can see uh, when we have them scheduled here. There'll be one in September, one in December, March, and then uh, June. That's it. Any questions? Mr. Rawls, inside of 10 minutes? Uh, that's what I was listening to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. So what do you think? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Wow. So, September 9th. First time for everybody. <laughs> First time for everybody. Yeah. Did you have some questions, though? <laughs> I'm going to say probably within the next week to two weeks, we'll have the index. And as soon as I have it, I'll share it with the board. Any other questions? All right. That's the answer. Yeah. All right. You get it better. <laughs> better. You get it better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next up is uh, <laughs> minutes from August 19th. Can I get a motion? Johnson moves. Patrick seconds. The move and second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Next up is number six. Emergency operation plan. Mm -hmm. Well, I can take both of those. Do, do we have an A and B? I can take A and B. Do you just want to go to a representative from the Black Student Union? I'm just out of curiosity if there's anybody here. I get a motion. I'm sorry. Could you repeat your question? Oh, I just wondered if there's somebody here from the Black Student Union who would like to say something about it. Oh, I, I'm the, one of the co-founders. You met uh, my other co-founder, oh, um, Deshira Coates. Yeah, so we really just want to start this club. Come up to the panel. For those who don't know, I'm Jordan Bowser. I'm a senior at the high school. And um, yeah, so we really just want to start a Black Student Union to bring the community closer together within our school. We are a majority, minority majority school, but a lot of us don't either don't know each other or we haven't spoken to each other in a long time. So for there to be a majority of us and for us not to really know each other and connect with each other to me is an issue. And as I you know transition off to college, I want to make sure that those after me have a place to gather, get together, you know, talk, have fun, do activities, and do things for the community as well. So that was kind of the idea when you know, when you create a Black Student Union. And, and I believe that there was an African American Heritage Club before, but it kind of like died out. So after hearing that, I was like, we need to, have to start something new again. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. How do you plan on recruitment? 
Perfect. Um, same way that we do with, um, with most of our other clubs, uh, QR codes that we have something called the WIP, so it plays every single morning, announcements and things like that. Okay, so you're just going to make that announcement daily? Yes. Talk so this is not just for black students. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I know it should, be, not what it's for. should it be minority students? No, technically, technically speaking, we don't. Because we don't, be our, idea, our, object, our objective isn't really to discriminate against anyone. Anyone mm -hmm. willing to contribute to the black community in our advance, mm -hmm. advancement, making sure that we have what we need to succeed is welcome to join the club. Okay, good. Be all inclusive. Yeah. All right, can I get a motion? Uh, I have a question. Uh, but why don't we get a motion on the floor before we uh, start? That's right. Yeah, we got to get a motion on the floor. If we don't get a motion on the floor, then we can't start. That's okay. a motion for I didn't even get a first. 6 a.m. Yes. Johnson moves. 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Okay. No second. Okay. The move in second. Now time for discussion. Okay. Um, so I noticed in the purpose, um, there were specific enumerated principles um, facilitating and enhancing academic success for African American students. Encouraging diversity on the part of the faculty administration and student might be. Um, I'm just curious, like, is there a is is there a plan to create, I guess, some dialogue directly with the administration? In, uh, or is is there a plan for uh, interfacing with the administration to like make those things happen? Or is the like, do you plan to do that? Like in a tertiary area. Yeah. But we usually, when we have a motion on the floor, only board members can talk. But since this is a, something new here, I won't grant that. But most time, once we have a motion, only we <laughs> discuss the motion. Now, you want to get a clarification on something? I, I, I meant you mentioned administration. All right. Is that what you asked, Ms. Uh, Johnson? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So the administration, I have to ask that question. No, I think what he's saying is how will you yes. engage the administration yes. of the student group? Right. right. I'm asking a question about the bylaws that are part of the matter that we're voting on, and I'm directing that to the subject matter expert. Well, I don't think. Do y'all have the answer for that? Uh, well, yeah. The, we yeah. Bylaws, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So part of our um, plan is to make sure that Black students are being represented properly without threatening throughout the district, and I have personally monthly meetings with administration. So yeah, that's part of our goal is not only to build community, but make sure that we're talking with administration on how to do that as, together. Okay, thank you. Bring has also been on my advisory. Mm -hmm. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Uh, personnel. Now, we can go personnel. A through E. Personnel. A through E. Johnson moves. Johnson Lamel. The move in second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Next is finance. All right. Finance. Mm -hmm. A through A through D. Finance. I get a motion. Johnson moves. Johnson seconds. Moved by Steve Johnson, second by Kalanja Johnson. In the discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? I seven. Next is uh contracts. I think they're all Action item. Uh, I would ask you first. A through nine A through C. Nine A through through C. You only want to go to C. Nine A through C. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Can I have get a second? Second. The movement second. Uh, Johnson made the motion. Hatchet seconded. 
Been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. That was just discussion. Any, any discussion? Anybody see anything in there want to discuss? Mm -hmm. The next up is B, B, A, B number 11. Uh, A. Johnson moved 11 A and B. Johnson second A and B. Been moved by Johnson, second by Johnson. Johnson. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Seven. Nothing under oh, PSP candidates. Discussion. This is a uh, candidate for PSP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is this is this are they going to a conference? Yes, it, yeah, it, 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 yeah. We're not the officers, I guess the PSBA officers. Uh, then we get a hand up. There'll be a delegates, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll be the delegates. Yeah. The and yeah. when is that? Is that November? Uh, yes, sir. But I think it's talking about the the um uh elect, like the presidents of the PSPA and those yeah. the, those those officers. Yeah. Oh, whoever's on this yeah. site. Oh, yes. okay, yes. okay, yes. okay. I got you. That's right. Then we have a slate that comes out, and most time you fill it out and vote the way you want. Yeah. These are the candidates. Yeah, yeah. Candidates. Most time you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. They give us a brief history of them. So you have it in your package there. So that's it. Anything else on the new business? Nothing. I guess this is just to discuss. Huh? Oh, uh, yes, as far as um, new business, I'd like to a motion to discuss uh, changing the name to match the bare imagery. No, no we, we, we didn't talk about uh, we were referring to the Indian name rather than uh, we, we voted to have to allow the bare imagery. But I'm just uh, to, 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 to discuss and then down on the future on the future. Well, I think, I think we'll put it on the we'll put it on the agenda. Put it on the agenda for the next time. Yes. So what will that mean? That would mean that we would discuss it in the executive session and then no. No, 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 no. discuss it yes. at the meeting. Discuss at the meeting. So you tell me what you want to put on the on the agenda to discuss the name Indian? Uh yes. To to that, is that, no, no, that no, no. the discussion is your chunk? Okay. You want to discuss what to do with it? To 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 change the um, uh, motion to discuss changing the name uh, in the, uh, the changing the name of the sorry the name that which is currently Indian to um, to change it to bears to change the mascot from Indian to bears. Yeah, we got to put that on the another agenda. Okay, 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 I wasn't. Thank you. I just wanted to check and see how that would work. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can I just say something? Now, I'll put this to get on the agenda. So, I have to have six people say yes. Thanks. The most will be calling you. She will not tell you how many votes she needs. She will just call you and to ask you. You want to put this on the agenda? Okay. So, my login. What question are you going to ask? I mean, you're allowed to ask a question tonight about what's going on. We're I'm, talking about putting. I'm asking a question as to what the kids display. They display their mascot bears with their name Indians in it. Are we in it? Yes, they did. The yes, they did. That's what we voted on. Was it, I mean, was the 
What's the, the word? The word Indians were in it. We're not moving. We didn't. We're not. We wasn't moving the name Indians. Oh, so we, is that what this discussion is coming up? Well, that, it, no, it won't be discussed unless it's on the agenda. We've okay. got to get on. You have to get on the agenda before you can discuss it. What we approve, my understanding, is to uh, is to approve the use of bear imagery for athletics. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. yes, we have to, to approve the use of bear imagery for athletics. Is what we approve and. That's I, yeah, and what I'd like to, to bring up is the ability to um, discuss or to, to change the, the name mm -hmm. instead of the Indians to uh, bears or the, the golden bears in terms of um, what uh, originated the bear theme sort of. And I will be in touch with the board member. Uh, I, will, I will discuss, I will say this to the board. When it comes to school, Names and changes, image and things like that. Found out it's something that administration handles and not the board. So there's no policy, there's no, because the reason why, I, now this is mine, is that once you give a name, who's going to change the name or color? So it's never there. I went through this at the Vote Tech, they want to change the color. So. This is something we've been down this road before. Uh, to really think about this, we've been down this road before, and uh, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to influence anybody one way or the other. So now the other two people are not here, so they don't know what we're talking about. But there, there seems to be some some a, a lack of clarity as to what it was that we voted on earlier. In terms of what the students gave, and so like I just wanted to know, could we have Amory? Could you state again, like for the record, like what it was we voted for? Look on the agenda. It look was bare. Look on the agenda, right? Bare imagery. Right. For so it, it's like number eleven. Look at number eleven and look at what you wrote for, <laughs> and they showed you the picture. She says I'm, I'm hearing two imagery. different things from the end. That, that's why I'm asking for, for so I can clarify that of clarity. Yes, according to what. Ian said, Ian was saying, Ian, he wanted to discuss moving the name India. I understand, so but he, he was in reference to, <laughs> we voted this in. We so. voted to keep India in. Right. right, because it was already encompassed. It was already, yeah, yeah they, they went down to the road and to meet everybody halfway and make everybody happy, the community and the ex-graduates. Is the kids came up with with the bear because that's part of the Indians also. So my advice: don't wake up that dog. Don't poke the bear. Don't poke the bear. Don't poke the bear. I don't Sorry, I would go into discussion about it, but. Uh, and just, no, 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 I, I can't. I'm not going to go into discussion about it. So I'm going to like see. That, that was earlier tonight. Really discuss yeah. everything. Okay. Well, I okay. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Good morning. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Uh, so we'll be getting the phone call from Dr. Phillips. So, yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh,